And with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Frey from Brookings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. It's, it's a real pl pleasure for me to be here today. I think ice cream and millennials is a, is a great combination. So I think that uh, it's good to have a, a full room for, for this. Um, you know, I have a confession to make. I'm not a millennial, uh, even though I'm going to talk about millennials. There are different ways of classifying who millennials are. Researchers differ. I use people born between 1981 and 1997. And there are others that even have wider uh, bands. But none of them are so wide to include me. But I, ha I just have a question of how many millennials are here in the audience today? OK, so that's quite a, <laughs> that's quite a group. Um, and I, so what I want to say is, there's a lot in this here for you millennials, but there's also a lot here for people who just who did not raise their hand, who I assume are older than millennials. And uh, because I think that uh, how um, we as a nation treat millennials, especially the, the really the, the most diverse young adult population that we've had in our, in our history up till now, is going to mean a lot about how the country moves ahead and how us older generation folks are going to benefit as a result of the way this diverse generation is, be, is able to succeed in terms of how they you know, turn out in terms of their own success, their ability to uh, overcome barriers with respect to race and other kinds of issues. How we deal with that and how we let them do that is going to be very important. Uh, the reason I started working on millennials is uh, after the 2010 census, uh, and I've seen a lot of censuses, someone my age, uh, I was really very uh, wowed by the diversity that this country had. I mean, I was following the racial trends and the ethnic trends in the US, but I was really wild. You can really only know how big a certain population group is from a decennial census. You have to count everybody, and by counting everybody, it's much better than a survey. It's much better than any, any kind of data. And so it's important to keep that in mind. I know Julie's going to talk a little bit about the 2020 census and, and some of the questions in that. So. Uh, that's really important. The census is, is really the benchmark. Anyway, as a result of this, uh, I published this book, uh, Diversity Explosion, which is a new and updated edition coming out next Wednesday. Just thought I'd mention it while I'm here. <laughs> and um, in, in talking about the book, what I learned and, and in sort of just following things in, in society and in politics, we have kind of an older generation, a largely white generation, which has really made its success in the 20th century. And the younger generation of millennials and post-millennials, much more racially diverse, which I call the 21st century uh, generation. And I think the millennial generation, and this is how I decided to, to do a little more work with millennials, is really the bridge between this older 20th century generation and this younger 21st century generation. And it's really a bridge to a more racially diverse America. And so what I want to talk about today uh, is covering some aspects of the millennial population, but focusing uh, a lot on this racial diversity and the bridge role of, of millennials. So here's a chart. Uh, well, here are the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, who are millennials and how distinct are they? Where are millennials living? And uh, how will they serve as a bridge across generations? You know, I think we know, think we know a lot about millennials, but if you listen to a lot of the major media, you get the idea that most millennials are young professionals living in Brooklyn. That's not really the case. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people with different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different educational attainments, and all this. And we're trying to cover that a little bit. But I first want to get to this bridge generation thing a little bit. And what I show here is four broad age groups uh, and the racial profiles for each of these four broad age groups, people age 55 and over. These are as of 2015. So people age 55 and over, a lot of baby boomers and some people older than baby boomers. Uh, you can see very white population. The 35 to 54 year old age group, largely Gen Xers, but a few ba baby boomers in there. Uh, and that of 62% white is about what the US population is. So Gen Xers uh, have kind of the racial profile of, of the US population. But when you get down to the uh, millennial population, 18, ages 18 to 34, you see that only, uh, you see that uh, 50, 56% of the millennial population is white uh, compared to 75% of the older generation. And when you get down to the post-millennial generation, uh, we're getting close to half and half. In fact, new census numbers that came out a few weeks ago showed that the population under age 10 in the United States is minority white. 
according to census definitions. So this is important to understand the way our population is moving forward. Uh, now, a lot of people will look at this diversity. I mean, it's, it's important to understand how we've gotten so diverse. And, and, and sometimes there's an unfounded uh, fact that it's current immigration that is making this country so diverse, so racially diverse with all the Latinos and Asians and so forth. Well, it's true that immigration over the last three decades has helped to make our country more racially diverse. But in fact, right now, most of the growth in the Latino population, most of the growth in the minority population in the United States is due to natural increase. That means births to people already here. So we're going to continue to become more diverse irrespective of our immigration patterns going forward. And we need to understand that because that's really the nature of the youth and, and, and of course now the young adult millennial population. I'm gonna do something that's kind of demographically wonky here. This is something that's like a half of a population pyramid. And what I'm showing you is for 1980, um, the age uh, patterns of people going from zero, zero to four at the bottom to 85 and over at the top, and the length of the bars is the size of the different populations in those age groups. That group that's age 16 to 34 are the baby boomers back in 1980. There was no millennial born yet in 1980, but in 1980, the baby boomers were really the big part of the population. They impacted the economy, they impacted you know, society in all kinds of different ways. And uh, you can see that the influence even that the baby boomers had today is a result of the fact that back then they were one third of the US population. Well, let's move to 2015. And the baby boomers move up to the older ages. They're now in 2015 ages uh, 51 to 69, but there are the millennials popping up, age 18 to 34. Uh, they have some competition still with the baby boomers, but they are kind of a force to be reckoned with themselves. I want to mention two things about the millennials on this population pyramid that are important. One is, like the baby boomers, they're a bigger population than people slightly older than them and people slightly younger than them, so they have that extra impact on what's going on. The second thing I want, to, want you to see is that among those people younger than the millennial population, there is a shrinking part of that population are whiter young people, and an increased part of that population are racial and ethnic minorities. And what this means is that going forward, as that young population moves into those labor force years and later, uh, it's going to be a much more racially diverse America. It's baked in the demographic cake when you look at it this way. And a lot of people don't understand that this is really what our future is when we look at these kinds of statistics. Now I want to say a little bit about some of the attributes of millennials. Uh, one of them is that they're global in many ways. For example, one quarter of millennials speak a language other than English at home. And in fact, one out of six millennials are multilingual. They speak a language other than English at home, and they're fluent in English. So we're a very multilingual uh, generation, much more so than earlier generations in the United States. 29%, almost three out of 10, are first or second generation Americans. Again, bigger than earlier generations when they got to be this young adult age. And then also 14% of married millennials are in interracial marriages. Uh, this is compared with one out of 20 baby boomers uh, when they were the same age. So in lots of ways, millennials are very different and very sort of connected to other backgrounds and other ethnicities and sort of globally connected. A couple of attributes of millennials I think you probably already know about. Uh, the sort of the proverbial millennial living in their parents' basement. As a result of that, we see that millennials are putting on hold or putting off getting married, putting off having children, putting off some of those attributes of their uh, uh, life that uh, earlier generations didn't. Here's kind of a complicated slide, but what it shows is for each broad racial group, uh, the three bars represent uh, for baby boomers, for Gen Xers, and for millennials, the percent who were married at age 25 to 34. So for whites, for example, the baby boomers, when they were 25 to 34, 70% were already married. Now only 48% of white millennials are currently married. Similar kind of trends you see for the other racial groups. Uh, so you know what this means is you certainly have more independence for a lar larger part of your youth if you're a millennial, but it also uh, sort of keeps you from getting that start maybe towards home ownership or start starting a career. A lot of this has had to do with the recession, the 2007 to 2009 recession, which increased unemployment rates dramatically and kept younger people from going into the labor market quickly, and also the housing market crash, uh, which has kept them from going into home buying, which is, we're still feeling the effects of. 
Here's another attribute with uh, millennials that I think uh, people understand, and this is they're the most educated young adult generation that we've ever had in the United States. 36% of millennials have college degrees who are age 25 to 34. It was only 24% among baby boomers when they were that age. Here again, we see that that increase in college education is occurring for whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. So that's the good news. The not so good news is we still have a very sharp racial disparity in educational attainment between whites and some Asian Americans on the one hand and African Americans and Hispanics on the other hand. Uh, now there is improvement among Latinos and blacks every year. New statistics come out and say that there are more uh, blacks and Latinos getting post-secondary educations. Fewer of them are dropping out of high school. But you can see this disparity this is still there. There's a historic aspect to it. That is, many blacks and Hispanics live in underfunded, segregated, uh, grew up in underfunded, segregated school districts and segregated residential places. Patterns have brought that about, and that still exists. There's also the fact that the parents' generation of many of these folks aren't able to give them the kind of support for college tuition and other kinds of costs that you would need to go to college. Sometimes, in fact, it, it goes the other direction. The young people are expected to bring money back to the parents because of the way things are going uh, for them. So, I mean, this is an issue I think that really we need to be concerned about as we move forward uh, because, as I said, the millennial population is much more racially and ethnically diverse. Just a quick one on home ownership. We also see this di divisiveness uh, between whites uh, on the one hand and other racial minorities in the percent who uh, own their home. Now, it's true that millennials, as I said earlier, are less likely to own homes than other generations when they got to this age, to some degree due to the economy and the housing market and stuff like that. Uh, but that especially had uh, the impact of widening the racial disparity uh, because of that, because especially African Americans and Hispanics dealt with these kind of risky mortgages, some subprime mortgages, and, and these sorts of things, higher uh, foreclosure rates during the post-recession economy kept that wider. So I mean, I think as a result of some of this, I can say uh, that there are two indicators that broadly people understand are important for future success. One is education, which has a relationship with your future income. The other is home ownership, which has a lot to do with your future wealth accumulation. And in this respect, there's a real divide within the millennial generation by race ethnicity. And going back to that demography that I showed you earlier, there are much bigger, these minority populations are a much bigger part of that new college age population, home buying population as we move into the future. The new census statistic for the people under age 10 show that 40% of kids under age 10 are either Hispanic or African American. Slightly less than half are white. And you can see that pushing ahead when folks go into the years. And so how a millennials fare as role models, as people who can be uh, you know, symbols of success for this younger generation are gonna be very important as we move forward. Now I wanna say a little bit about where millennials live. Uh, millennials, the younger population grew by about 5% between 2010 and 2015. It's largely, as I said, millennials are a bigger generation than the one right before it, so you can see that young adult population growing a little bit. But for those black uh, metropolitan areas on this map, like Seattle and Denver, and a few in Texas, and Dallas, San, uh, Dallas, uh, San Antonio, Austin, uh, and a few other places, that growth is more than 5%. It was 10% or higher. Other places, uh, the whiter dots, mostly in the Midwest, that growth isn't very rapid at all. So there's a, there's a disparity across metropolitan areas in, in the growth of millennials due to migration patterns. Interestingly, when you look at by race, I didn't put that up here, the biggest gaining uh, millennial metropolitan area in the United States for blacks is Atlanta, followed by Dallas and Houston and later Washington, D.C. So there's uh, different groups are going to different places and it's still, for a long time, Atlanta has been a big magnet for African Americans and now African American millennials. There's, of course, disparity across states in terms of just the racial composition of millennials. Those red states in the Southwest, and then also Florida, Georgia, Maryland, and New Jersey are minority white millennial populations. Less than one-third of California's millennials are white. There's another set of orange states there. There's 10 of those where more than 40% of their millennial population are minority. And those nine states that are the very light yellow they're ones where still 80% of the millennial population is white, like Wyoming or Iowa or West Virginia, you can see. Here's another sh slide that shows metropolitan area disparities by race. You can see Los Angeles 
uh, has a very small percentage of whites, and over half of the millennials in the Los Angeles metropolitan area are Hispanic, whereas in Atlanta, blacks are the big uh, population group among Hispanics, and in Minneapolis, St. Paul, still largely white. Uh, I did some other data. I don't have slides for them, but there's also variation across metropolitan areas in educational attainment. Remember I said that 36% of millennials have college degrees. In Boston, 58% of millennials have college degrees. And in, uh, in uh, Central California, uh, it's more down into the 14 or 15% for, for, for the millennial population. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of disparity, and I think these places that uh, are wanting to look at the next generation after millennials to be able to uh, see how they're going to fare in the labor market, see how they're going to be prosperous. They need to see that you know there's a great deal of variation, and they need to look at that homegrown millennial population to see how they're going to be able to fare, maybe attract people from somewhere else, but they need to know how that differs over time. So now I want to talk about this more about this bridge to the next generation. Uh, and uh, or how the millennials are a bridge between uh, yesterday's America and tomorrow's uh, America. You know, we talk about generation gaps in the United States uh, from time to time. Uh, back when I was young, the generation gap was in the 60s. A lot of baby boomers were thought of as being the Woodstock generation. The Woodstock generation, I wasn't at Woodstock myself, but the Woodstock generation was made up of people who had sort of a counterculture back then. They were revolutionary and they sort of were quite different in their outlooks than their parents were. Well, millennials also are part of a generation gap. You might say in terms of social attitudes like favoring legalization of marijuana or favoring uh, same-sex same marriage uh, or maybe their, their difficult attitudes about institutions in the U.S. like organized religions and so forth, that that may be part of a generation gap. But I think the biggest generation gap for millennials is based on race and culture, and by that I mean uh, if you look at the, I've redone this again, this is again the race profiles, but I brought this down to three age groups, people older than millennials, people age, over age 35 in 2015, millennials age 18 to 34, and people younger than millennials under age 18. You can see how the very different racial breakdown is also represented of different sets of attitudes, different sets of issues, different sets of concerns about the future. Uh, and if you think back about older baby boomers, people my age, older white baby boomers, uh, many of them, not necessarily me, but many older white baby boomers, are kind of scared about this changing demography in the United States. And if you think about it, uh, older white baby boomers grew up at a time uh, when there wasn't much immigration, where the black population was highly segregated, and they're scared. And uh, when you see that we're moving into a situation in the country where uh, you know, surveys show that older whites really don't want to see as much immigration in the future. They don't want to support government programs that affect children because they don't see them as their children or their grandchildren because they're different race and ethnic backgrounds. That's kind of a problem uh, that we need to deal with because, as you can see, we need to invest in that younger generation. So I think that, uh, you know, moving ahead, the, the millennial generation is really going to be the key towards making this go. And they have a lot going for them because they're well educated, they embrace diversity. What, they have, what they're going to need is more help from the rest of us and from the rest of the population to make sure there's investment not only in their careers but also the, the careers below them. And so I'm just going to end and say I'm a demographer and I think demography is destiny. And when you look at the demography going ahead, you're going to see that it's the racial and ethnic uh, makeup of millennials and especially post-millennials that are going to shape this country in the next century. It needs the older population needs to recognize this so we can invest in that future. Thanks.